Hello and welcome to the Spine and Nerve Podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Hovez. And my name is Dr. Nicholas Carvelis. And we are going to be continuing our discussion on discogenic pain today uh, by presenting a case. Uh, but before we kind of get started and in diving into this case, once again, just want to say thank you for everybody for listening, uh, for subscribing, leaving us reviews and reaching out and letting us know how you're feeling about this. You know, it really does uh, mean a lot to us to get your messages and to, you know, know that we're helping with uh, patients care across the country and across the world. And so thank you for that. Uh, please continue to uh, share and subscribe uh, to the podcast. Um, every person that you sh send this to, uh, to learn more from us, uh, helps us to continue growing and continue to do the work that we love doing. Um, so without further ado, we've covered discogenic pain uh, a little bit already. So we covered the basics of it, uh, went a little bit into some of the regenerative options uh, for treating it last time. And today we're going to talk through a case to kind of go from the very beginning of uh, the patient's presentation and walking them through some of the conservative options and eventually maybe to some of the more invasive options that we have uh, for treating this type of pain. Um, so Dr. K, can you please uh, introduce us to our patient today? Yeah, so this uh, case uh, essentially is a young, uh, uh, relatively young patient, a 41-year-old woman, uh, actually a physician, um, you know, otherwise uh, fairly healthy and active um, who's presenting with a chronic uh, over one year of moderate to severe centralized uh, low back pain uh, with no radicular features, which um, as we get into some of the treatment options we're considering is going to be, uh, become important in terms of what we're considering uh, as treatment, treatment options for this patient. Um, in terms of significant objective data, uh, so on exam, again, no signs or symptoms uh, concerning for radiculopathy and no clear uh, signs or symptoms um, uh, consistent with facetogenic pain, although as you may remember from our uh, talks uh, regarding uh, uh, predominantly facetogenic pain, uh, you know, on exam, those findings can be relatively difficult to find, although we talked about, you know, the specific tenderness to palpation over the facet joints and, and reproduction of symptoms with facet loading. So bottom line is nothing uh, uh, clearly indicative of radiculopathy or facetogenic pain, and her, her overall clinical presentation was uh, consistent with predominantly discogenic pain. Uh, and in addition, on her imaging, um, uh, again, no, uh, uh, no significant uh, foraminal or central stenosis, but she did have some uh, disc degeneration at uh, L4-5 with some corresponding uh, associated uh, modic changes at the L4 and L5 uh, vertebrae. And as, as a quick review, as we talked about the different modic changes, which are essentially abnormal signals on uh, our uh, lumbar MRI. And uh, we had talked about how with the three different modic changes, that modic changes type one and type two are really the modic changes that seem to be the strongest associated with um, uh, chronic low back pain. Uh, I know we talked about some statistics uh, last time, but just as a quick review, you can find meta-analyses looking at motor changes, and you'll see that if you take a population that uh, uh, is asymptomatic with no significant low back pain, um, the frequency of finding motor changes on those images would be in the single, single digits around four to five percent. In contrast to if you have a group of individuals with significant chronic low back pain, the uh, probability of finding these modic, modic type one or type two changes would be closer to 40 to 50%. So obviously uh, those amongst other studies um, uh, supportive of this concept that if there are these modic changes on MRI, it's suggestive of uh, uh, pain uh, uh, associated with the disc and uh, potentially this uh, vertebrogenic chronic low back pain which uh, we'll get into a little more depth when we're uh, talking about the uh, treatment options available to us. Right. Let's let's take a step back. You, you brought it. So, you know, young woman, young youngish woman. I guess uh, I guess young is the eye of the beholder. At this point, forty-one sounds young to me. Uh, young woman who is relatively healthy, relatively active, a year plus of uh, moderate to severe. Uh, centralized low back pain. Let's dive a little bit deeper into this patient uh, presentation just uh, to try to kind of, you know, define a little bit more for our, our audience, right? So you said no clear radicular factors. 
Um, so, you know, you said centralized low back, not radiating down the legs, generally speaking, you said not really facetogenic in nature. And so what, when she's coming in and presenting with this pain, um, you know, what, when is she saying she's having the most pain? What are the maybe positions or timings of the day uh, that are giving her the most challenge? Yeah. And so, you know, typical of a lot of our patients that we are worried about discogenic pain in with, you know, certain exacerbating factors. Uh, so, you know, if she is sitting there after clinic writing notes, so being in the kind of prolonged seated position uh, is one of the things she mentioned that really can flare up her symptoms, you know, towards the end of the day, she's been on her feet all day. And now she's sitting down to do clinic notes, doesn't have a sit to stand desk, which is potentially something we can, you know, think about in terms of conservative measures. Isn't it just painful to write notes at the end of the day? That Yes, that's true. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we all try to have good posture, but after your, you know, 10th, 11th uh, clinic note, you start to uh, <laughs> be thinking about other things besides maintaining that perfect posture. And so, the, but, but the bottom line is, and I think we've all, uh, through our time in medicine, potentially seen those diagrams where, uh, you know, and I, I think it's really easy for patients to grasp the concept of, okay, if I try to lift something by leaning forward and getting my, uh, uh, my upper body over my, you know, away from the, my, my center of mass, and I try to lift something uh, that's far away from my center of mass, of course, that's, that's a lot of pressure on the disc. And I think that's easy to grasp. But kind of one of the things I emphasize to patients is more of the way I um, associate or the way my analogy is kind of like blood pressure, where blood pressure is a, a silent, uh, you know, a silent killer to some degree, you know, same with sitting in that slouch position, it, it may actually feel somewhat good uh, initially for patients, but we know from uh, 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 evaluating the pressure on the disc that that prolonged slouch position is actually pretty uh, detrimental to pressure on the disc and ultimately uh, contributing to, to the disc pain and disc degeneration long term. So bottom line is, I guess, to answer your question in terms of uh, when she was feeling a lot of her pain, you know, definitely, obviously, with lifting, uh, lifting objects can be painful for her, for her, but that prolonged sitting was another thing she brought up. All right. And then I think you said that she was pretty active. Um, and so um, talk to me a little bit about how activity may or may not play a role in either protecting or causing, causing more uh, challenges uh, for the disc. Yeah, so, you know, as we know, um, the, the main function of that disc is going to be to deal with axial loads, uh, you know, loads during uh, bending or rotation as well. And so, uh, you know, in this individual, they they are very active. They're actually uh, trained to do a, uh, a marathon. Um, so, you know, running on hard surfaces, you know, is a, a fair amount of, of compressive forces and axial load uh, on that disc. A lot of times with my patients that, that I'm worried about, you know, significant uh, discogenic pathology, I really bring up swimming if I can, because uh, that's a low impact uh, environment that you still get an amazing uh, workout and importantly you're activating those paraspinal muscles uh, when you're horizontal in the water uh, so bottom line is a low impact exercise that you can really strengthen the uh, core muscles the paraspinal musculatures uh, and I, you know i think it can be one of the better things you can do uh, for chronic low back pain or uh, discogenic pain yeah you know i think one of the things that i see often when we're uh, seeing patients with uh, chronic discogenic pain is you know, you see, uh, so obviously running on hard surfaces can be really challenging um, when patients are riding a bike, especially if they're relatively new to a bike where their positioning might not be optimized. Uh, I think that can lead to increased pressure uh, on the discs and can be challenging for people. Um, you know, and then kind of just going back to the overall clinical picture, uh, car rides are a common thing they hear about, right? You know, that inability to really get very comfortable um, in uh, while sitting in the car, always having to fidget and move around and trying to just shift that pressure away. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, maybe this is a slight, slight aside. Um, anecdotally, I've actually seen things like horseback riding and motorcycle riding to be, depending on the patient, either extremely bad or beneficial. Um, for them. And in my head, my theory, my thought process is, 
you know, people that are used to motorcycle riding or used to horseback riding um, have developed that musculature. And so their bodies are kind of used to protecting. So when they get into those positions, you know, they know the proper form, they activate the muscles in the appropriate way and therefore are able to unload that disc mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if, you know, it's something that's relatively newer or if it's something uh, that is, you know, they're changing the way that they're, uh, you know, change their bike or change their, uh, the horse saddle or something along those lines. Um, I don't know. Yes. No, no, that makes sense. I mean, if, if, you know, in those uh, positions you described, if, I mean, cause we know that, you know, activating the core and being in certain positions can decrease, uh, uh, you know, problematic pressure across the disc. So, you know, that, that does make sense. Yeah. All right. And so obviously, you know, somebody's dealing with this pain, dealing with it for, you know, roughly a year, they're going to have started to go through some more conservative options. Right. And so I presume, you know, physical therapy tends to be a place that people will start. Obviously, she's more active of a patient and, you know, was doing a lot of training on her own. Uh, when this does this patient go, did this patient go to physical therapy? What are the kinds of things that, you know, they were working on or that the patient can be expected to work on as we're, as we're thinking about uh, physical therapy for discogenic pain? Yeah, so this patient definitely, you know, did physical therapy, did a home exercise program uh, consistently in addition to other uh, conservative measures, which uh, uh, I think we'll get to in a second. But yeah, you know, from a physical therapy standpoint, uh, you know, they did the, the typical, you know, working on uh, uh, paraspinal muscle strengthening, hip girdle. Uh, uh, strengthening as well as, you know, flexibility, making sure that, you know, the hamstrings aren't uh, too tight and uh, pulling the pelvis in a way that's putting more pressure on the, uh, the disc itself. And so, um, uh, yeah, bottom line is the, uh, uh, this patient definitely uh, did the formal followed by a home exercise program and still had significant refractory symptoms. Okay. So, so now we have this patient, you're out of pain or a year of pain and has been doing the exercises, been to physical therapy, coming in, what are, what are your first thoughts? How are, we, how are we, you have the imaging, you kind of see what's going on, you do the exam, like you said, nothing extremely uh, jumping out in your exam, no weakness, no numbness, uh, reflexes are uh, appropriate. Uh, so what, where, what are you thinking? What, are, what is the plan as we start kind of working our way through uh, this treatment, these treatment algorithms? Yeah, and so by the time we saw this patient, you know, they had done the physical therapy home exercise program uh, fairly rigorously. Uh, they had, you know, tried a back brace. They had uh, utilized medications, both topical anti-inflammatories, lidocaine patches, uh, utilized uh, over-the-counter medications, Tylenol, um, uh, as well as uh, anti-inflammatory medications. Um, their uh, primary care doctor had uh, utilized uh, muscle relaxers as well as some uh, neuropathic medications, um, uh, uh, gabapentin, Lyrica, trying to have some. But so, bottom line is, she had been on uh, you know a lot of the oral medications we would potentially consider for this. So essentially, when they came to us, you know, one of the one of the initial things we we think of because uh, you know it is uh, number one we have seen some success uh, with it clinically. Uh, and, you know, also it's uh, an accepted therapy uh, th uh, through insurance as well is, you know, the concept of trying to place strong anti-inflammatory pain medication uh, at the level of the disc to see if we can break that pain cycle, decrease the inflammation, um, you know, and then let the body take over in terms of uh, healing moving forward. And she's already, you know, someone that's putting in a lot of work in terms of the, uh, the uh, core strengthening, paraspinal muscle strengthening. Um, so, you know, we did a, a trial, um, tr a bilateral transforaminal epidural injections with the thought process that that spread of the medicine would be uh, more anterior and hit the uh, posterior aspect of the disc that uh, potentially could be a significant uh, pain generator for the patient. Um, but ultimately, uh, the patient did not respond to uh, transforaminal uh, epidural injections uh, or not significantly, not with significant uh, sustained benefit. Um, so, you know, this was a patient that, uh, uh, and not to dive too deep into this because I know we really um, uh, discussed regenerative options and platelet rich plasma quite a bit with our uh, prior talk, but this was a patient that uh, underwent uh, intradiscal. Uh, a PRP, um, but uh, we were able to follow up with that patient several months afterwards and still um, having significant symptoms. And so we're now at the point, and we haven't yet 
done this uh, uh, specific uh, treatment, but we wanted to bring this treatment up because you know we've obviously done this series discussing discogenic pain, um, and uh, this is a relatively, uh, in the grand scheme of things, relatively newer, uh, newer therapy that uh, we wanted to make sure we at least brought up. And this is something we're considering for this patient. So obviously, moving forward down the road, if if this patient has a, uh, an out, you know, a positive outcome, obviously, or either way, we want to make sure we update you guys. But um, you know, uh, definitely, we'll give you updates in terms of how they uh, respond to this uh, potential therapy. But you know, bottom line is the uh, therapy that we wanted to make sure we brought up and discussed to some degree today was uh, uh, basovertebral nerve ablation for uh, uh, chronic low back pain that uh, thought to be vertebrogenic in, in uh, etiology. And uh, uh, as we've reviewed in the past, when we think about the what, what makes up uh, the lumbar uh, intervertebral disc, we as we know, the three major components being the annulus fibrosis, the nucleus pulposus, uh, but then also the vertebral end plate. And uh, we talked about um, how the vertebral end plate plays a significant role in that uh, degenerative cascade of the, of the spine. And as we, we may review here in a moment, um, there is significant uh, data, uh, 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 including you know, leading up to these clinical trials, showing that the vertebral end plate is a, a potential significant pain generator um, uh, and ultimately um, may be uh, a, a significant um, pathology that's contributing to this chronic, to chronic low back pain in a certain subset of patients. But before we get into the details of that therapy to make sure, like I said, that we do address that in this series, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about beforehand? No, I mean, I think you kind of brought up a lot of the the things that we try and, you know, obviously we're presenting this case because we think it's a little bit more interesting and probably one that doesn't necessarily fall within the, you know, I don't want to say the norm, but, you know, the that responds to the earlier methods of treatment, right? Obviously, if, you know, a person responds to physical therapy or to, you know, <laughs> to their a great home exercise program or a response to the first epidural, it's probably not going to be interesting enough to uh, talk about in general. And so we see these patients that uh, unfortunately do not respond to those earlier methods. And so we are grateful that medicine is evolving, specifically pain medicine is evolving to continue to have more and more options for these patients. Um, but you know, I, I always want to emphasize a lot of those earlier steps work for the vast majority of patients, right? And so doing, you know, the physical therapy, doing, uh, you know, an epidural or, or two, uh, doing these less invasive options is the norm for the way that we treat these patients. Um, but if, you know, if this patient responded to physical therapy, we would be done with our conversation. Sure. <laughs> and so uh, I, I always want to make sure that that is part of the conversation as we're talking about these patients. We're talking about patients that are kind of on the uh, the outskirts of uh, their response to you know, what is the kind of tried and true accepted um, treatments for the uh, I shouldn't say accepted, but the, the standard of care treatments. And then you start thinking about some of the other tools, right? And then, you know, so um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and to your point, I mean, as we've emphasized over and over again, always being systematic and, you know, thinking through your treatment algorithm, which we brought up multiple times before, you know, lifestyle, activity modifications, uh, therapies, medical equipment, medications, and then moving to our interventional procedures and potentially minimum, minimally invasive surgeries. Uh, and with those lifestyle modifications, I guess one thing we didn't necessarily, because this patient was otherwise healthy, just keeping in mind when we talked about the proven risk factors for discogenic pain, uh, uh, we know that you know obesity, smoking, genetics, age, uh, and uh, I think as Dr. Hovis brought up in our last one, uh, our last couple talks, you know, not a ton we can do about genetics or aging, but uh, obesity and smoking, and keeping in mind that you know, for example, for obesity, it's not just that. Uh, increased pressure on the disc, but it's also the increased inflammation throughout the body. And with smoking, it's not just the compromise to the oxygen supply to the disc, but that the nicotine itself can actually have a negative impact on the uh, healthy uh, uh, proliferation of uh, uh, of the cells in the disc and and of the interest, critical intracellular uh, or inter uh, disc uh, matrix. Yeah, and um, for, for a deeper dive, uh, we did an entire. <laughs> A podcast on 
smoking is still the new smoking. So to kind of go even deeper into what Dr. Carvelis was just talking about, please reference uh, that, which will be linked in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now, in, uh, specifically, the article I wanted to bring up was a uh, relatively recent article uh, pub published by Dr. Smook and his colleagues, uh, Dr. Smook being at uh, Stanford, um, uh, you know, done a lot for the field. And a uh, cool thing was he actually was a co-resident of my dad. Um, so I've you know, had a priv the privilege of meeting Dr. Smook a few times. And uh, you know, he's a really obviously awesome physician doing a lot for the field. And so we appreciate that. But, um, you know, uh, so this specific article was titled uh, Prospective randomized multi-center study of intraosseous basovertebral nerve ablation uh, for the treatment of chronic low back pain, 12-month uh, results. Um, and this was uh, published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain, Med and pain Medicine in 2020. So before I get into the details of this study, uh, I just thought it would be helpful to do a quick review of uh, some of the anatomy and, the, and the, also the technique for uh, uh, basal vertebral nerve ablation. So obviously, if we think about what, what we just said, you know, basal, basal vertebral nerve ablation. So what is the basal vertebral nerve? So the basal vertebral nerve is actually a branch off of the sinovertebral nerves. And if we think back to our anatomy, when we're thinking about the spine and the disc, the sinovertebral nerve is actually a junction, uh, or, or sorry, uh, a combination of uh, nerve branches coming off of both the autonomic nervous system. So uh, the gray ramus, um, uh, a branch from there. So it has, you know, that autonomic sympathetic uh, component to it, as well as coming off of the uh, ventral ramus, once you form the spinal nerve and you have the dorsal and the ventral ramus. So a branch off of the ventral ramus and the gray, uh, 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 gray ramus coming together to form that sinovertebral nerve. And then we know that from anatomic cadaver studies, we know that the sinovertebral nerve uh, innervates a lot of structures, including the uh, posterior uh, an annulus uh, uh, fibrosis. And, you know, the thought process being that that potentially uh, is, is contributing to some of the discogenic pain when our, um, uh, when we think that the uh, disc itself and the, and the annulus fibrosis are a significant contributor. But a, a branch off of the sinor, uh, sinor, sinovertebral nerve is this uh, basovertebral basal nerve, which enters the uh, vertebral body itself and then travels towards the center of the vertebral body uh, before then uh, uh, sending off branches to the vertebral end plate. And so what uh, research has shown is that um, there is quite a bit of um, density of these uh, basal vertebral nerves at the vertebral end plate. In fact, even more so than what we would see in the posterior annulus fibrosis. And that when these nerves are stained, for, for example, for substances like uh, substance P, which we know obviously would be indicative of nociceptive nerve fibers, that they light up. And so there's a high density uh, and proof of nociceptive uh, function uh, for these basal vertebral nerves. And that Obvi that subsequently led to the uh, uh, the theory of okay, well, if we you know we use radiofrequency ablation to treat a lot of different pain processes. Obviously, the one that uh, probably comes to mind is medial branch radiofrequency ablation for facetogenic pain. So you know a similar concept here, but we're targeting the basal vertebral uh, nerves. Uh, with the thought process being that this vertebral end plate, which as we've reviewed in the past, you know, due to uh, microtrauma, chronic stress, uh, lo long-term, um, uh, you know, microtrauma and stress uh, starts to be compromised and uh, uh, can have quite a bit of inflammation uh, associated with it. And so if we can modulate that, those basal vertebral nerves, we could potentially uh, improve the, uh, uh, that vertebrogenic uh, uh, pain that, that's occurring. Um, so in terms of exactly what that procedure involves, so it's a unilateral uh, entry through the pedicle. So essentially, once you identify on imaging that, okay, you have these modic changes um, and we're gonna target this specific vertebrae. So for example, in our, our patient example, the L4 and L5 vertebrae, you would, uh, you know, obviously looking at the imaging, you would map out how you're going to approach it. And like I said, it's going to be generally the center of that vertebral body, usually about 40 to 60% from the, uh, 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 for, in terms of the um, um, measurement of the length of the vertebral body, 
um, is where you're going to find the termination of that basovertebral nerve pathway before it branches out. And so that's going to be your, the target of your uh, uh, the end point of your, of your radiofrequency ablation probe ultimately, but you have to use a trocar to enter the pedicle. And once you just breach the, um, uh, the posterior wall of the vertebrae, and then, like I said, you're going to have that measurement about 40 to 60 percent of the length of the vertebral body from the posterior wall to the anterior wall of the vertebral body as your, uh, as your endpoint. But once you just barely breach that posterior wall of the vertebral body, you then replace the, uh, the trocar with a, um, with a plastic cannula with a stylet. And once you're able to get that plastic curved cannula to the target area, you take the stylet out and put the radiofrequency ablation probe in. One of the huge differences when we think about ablation of the basal vertebral nerve in contrast to how we would approach a, a medial branch nerve ablation is that you're uh, the time of ablation. So you're actually doing a 15 minute uh, um, uh, ablation uh, at 85 degrees Celsius to create that about one centimeter uh, spherical lesion in the center of the vertebral body at the level of the basal vertebral nerve. Yeah. And so just to kind of make that make sense for everybody who is not an interventional spine physician, um, it's a lot more invasive than most of the things that we do, but still a, what would be considered a minimally invasive procedure, right? This is not, you know, big surgery with rods and screws and open and things along those lines, you know, but when compared to what we would talk about for doing an epidural, or even if we were doing radio frequency ablation of the medial branches, um, this is a very different type of procedure. Um, and then just bringing up the amount of time uh, that you have to uh, run the uh, radio frequency probes. Uh, obviously, you know it, it does take a lot more energy, you know, for that system to do to work. But also, just in general, this is a this is a more invasive procedure, right? And so it's it's promising. We're going to start talking about some of the the research that's been done and the reason why it, we're we're at least entertaining this idea for uh, for pa this patient. Um, but you know, it is it is does fall on the more invasive side of the things uh, that most of the interventional uh, spine physicians do. Yeah. So going back to our study uh, uh, by Dr. Smook and his colleagues, so the purpose of the study was obviously to evaluate the clinical effectiveness of basovertebral nerve ablation relative to standard of care. And just real quickly, in terms of what they defined as standard of care, there wasn't necessarily a standardization in terms of every patient gets these specific things. But in general, what the standard of care included was physical therapy, uh, home exercise program, chiropractic treatment, acupuncture, uh, obviously medications, topical and oral, and then injections, including transforaminal. So uh, that, that was what most of the patients who were not receiving the basal vertebral nerve ablation were um, obtaining in terms of treatment. Um, and, you know, one of the other obviously obvious, obvious purposes of this article, uh, of this study, was to build on the prior randomized double-blind sham controlled trial by um, Dr. Fishgrund and his colleagues that was published in 2018 that ultimately demonstrated efficacy of basovertebral nerve ablation with durability of those clinical benefits up to five years. Um, so in terms of the methods of Dr. Smook's study, this was a prospective one-to-one -one randomized controlled trial of basovertebral nerve ablation versus standard of care in, uh, in multiple sites. It was a multi-center study, as I mentioned. So 23 different uh, uh, medical uh, sites uh, throughout the United States. And their follow-up times were uh, six weeks, three months, six months, uh, nine months, and 12 months. Um, uh, and of note, the standard care group at the six month time point, they were reassessed and got baseline measurements again, and then they were crossed over to basal vertebral nerve uh, ablation treatment. So you, as a consequence, uh, although there were some benefits to that, obviously in terms of looking at the data, uh, you lost that uh, control group at the six month uh, time point. Now, in terms of the uh, primary outcome measure, uh, it was the Oswestry Disability Index uh, in terms of the change of baseline. And then the secondary measures included uh, a number of different measures, but obviously including a uh, visual analog scale on a, a scale of one, uh, zero to 10 uh, for pain. Um, in terms of the results, so ultimately this study included 140 patients. Uh, and in terms of the randomization, it was 66 to the basal vertebral nerve ablation group and 74 to the standard care group. Um, at that 
uh, at the endpoints of three months and six months in terms of those outcome measures, including the Oswestry Disability Index and the uh, VA, uh, VAS. I just wanted to go over those quickly. So at three months, the basal vertebral nerve group had a change, uh, uh, you know, a, a positive um, uh, a clinical change, meaning a decrease in their Oswestry Disability Index score. But that change was 23.7 in a good direction for the patient in contrast to 4.6 for the standard care group. So obviously very significant uh, clinic, uh, statistically. Um, and then at six months that was sustained with a 25.1 uh, change in a good direction for the basal vertebral nerve group versus a 2.4 change uh, in a, uh, for the standard care group. And for uh, the visual analog scale, so at six months, uh, the group that had received the basal vertebral nerve ablation had a uh, 3.5 uh, so essentially a decrease in pain score by 3.5 in contrast to a decrease in 0. Uh, by 0. 0.4 in the standard care group. Um, of note, at the 12-month time uh, period, the uh, the benefits were sustained, although, like I said, you lost that control group, but uh, the basal vertebral ablation group still had a uh, about a 26-point reduction uh, in their Oswestry Disability Index score and about a four-point reduction in their VAS score. And of note, that group that uh, that was initially standard of care and then transitioned to basal vertebral ablation, they actually had similar changes uh, so again, they had about a 24, 25%, or sorry, 24, 25 point uh, improvement in their Oswestry Disability uh, Index uh, at that uh, six month time point for them, which would be the 12 month, 12 month time point for the study. So obviously the author's conclusion uh, was that basal vertebral nerve ablation demonstrates significant improvement in function and pain relative to standard of care, uh, rel relative to standard care with results sustained at 12 months uh, for patients with chronic low back pain of vertebrogenic origin. Uh, so, you know, that was the study that we wanted to make sure we addressed in the therapy we wanted to make sure we brought up because I think we had kind of really talked about some of the other uh, treatments uh, prior. Um, and, uh, you know, I think just one thing that I think both Dr. Hovez and I, you know, note, uh, note about this, and, and I think there's a good thing about this in the sense that we're, we're continuing to work to become more and more uh, uh, finessed in terms of optimizing our diagnosis of chronic low back pain and specific treatments for that. Um, but along those lines, if you look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria, they are very specific, you know, uh, for, for these type, these pa patients. And um, so, I, you know, that's something to keep in mind is that you want to, especially right now, as this is a relatively novel therapy, you want to be very selective in terms of the patients you choose this for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this is, you know, obviously a very uh, interesting uh, place to be able to direct uh, our attention as the uh, literature continues to build and the literature does continue to build, you know, and just to kind of emphasize, um, you know, some of the things that Dr. Carvelis was talking about. I mean, this was a very successful, um, study for these patients, right? I mean, he talked about the, um, the ODI differences of, you know, 25 or, uh, or a difference of, uh, 22, 20, 21, 22 versus the control groups. I mean, that's a very, uh, clinically relevant number, not just a statistically relevant number, right? So the MCID for uh, the ODI is about 13. Um, and so, I mean, you're, you're talking to have a clinical difference, you needed to have a, a change of 13 and this was in the twenties. And so, I mean, this is something that is interesting. I think there's, this is something that, uh, we're going to be paying attention to. And I think as the literature, uh, continues to build and obviously, you know, the literature will then lead to this being available for more patients. And so that way we can, uh, utilize this therapy, um, more effectively with uh, insurance and, and such. Um, but yeah, this is, it's, it's another tool. And the amazing thing, uh, as we continue to say about pain medicine, uh, especially in this 2021 juncture, is that we have so many more tools than we had 10 years ago. And, you know, you know 10 years ago, this patient would have done physical therapy, would have done ep epidurals, you know, 10 years ago, we're probably not, would, wouldn't have even necessarily tried maybe PRP, but I think it was very, very, um, you know, on the cutting edge at that point. Now, obviously it's something that's a lot more mainstream and we're continuing to evolve this. So patients have so many more options and so many more tools to be able to help them. Closing thoughts? 
Nope, that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, everybody. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Please uh, leave us a review. Let us know what you thought. Um, figure out how to convince Dr. Carvels to look at the camera when he's talking. If you can give him tips, he would really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid seeing myself. That's the, that's the uh, <laughs> but other than that, thank you for listening. And please stay tuned for those legal disclaimers.